Hello, my name is John, and this is the Mask Face Journal, and this is what I've been reading over the last few weeks. Sorry about that. Happy Christmas and Merry Holidays to everyone. Let's begin with Green Arrow number 12, written by Benjamin Percy and art by Otto Schmidt. This is a well-told story, slightly influenced by Dark Knight Returns and its perspective shifts going to the media discussing the Green Arrow. There were a few aspects of the story that I didn't like. It touches upon some real-world issues regarding politics and police brutality, and it handles those issues like most of society today, but that I mean without nuance. It's these are the good guys, these are the bad guys, end of story. I know that it is a superhero story and that is to be expected, but these issues aren't as simple as that. It doesn't help that this issue ends by setting up a trope in superhero storytelling that I absolutely hate. I'm not going to give it away, but if you've ever read Spider-Man, you should be familiar with this trope. Justice League number 10, written by Brian Hitch and art by Neil Edwards. No. Just no. I thought this story was stupid before, but it turns out it's even dumber. I can't really think of anything to say about this except it's really, really dumb. Flintstones number 6, written by Mark Russell and art by Steve Pug. As usual, this is a brilliant satirical look into our society through the lens of over-the-top cave people. But as with all good satire, it's sometimes uncomfortably close to the truth. It's a book that is difficult to talk about because it's not so much about the story, it's about the jokes and the individual moments of dark, biting humor. I say similar things about every issue, and it might be repetitive, but I do what I can to get people to read it. Superman number 12, written by Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason, and art by Doug Mankey. This issue taps into part of the DC universe that I'm almost, if not completely, ignorant of. Frankenstein's Monster and the Shade Organization. What we got here is the start of a story that, to my delight, is at least initially told from Lois Lane's perspective. There's not that much to say about it, because it's not that much story there yet. And what of it there is, I know nothing about. A slight bit of irritation comes from the fact that all of this seems to connect to Lois and Superman through complete coincidence, and that's a little hard to swallow. Batman number 12, written by Tom King and art by Michael Janine. Again, with the inner monologue, this time it's a letter being read. A letter from Bruce to Selina. I'm sorry, but this just feels so forced. I want to say it's pretentious, but I'm not 100% sure it applies. This story does not work for me. At all. Mostly because I don't understand why any of the characters act the way that they do. Why Batman's team consists of the members that it does. Intertwined with meta-narration about how the entire concept of Batman is ridiculous. No, not for me. That was one week done, let's jump into Supergirl number 4, written by Steve Orlando and art by Brian Cheng. This is a pretty classic scenario, the hero trapped, unable to interfere in the dastardly plan of the villain, and the only hope is to convince the villain's ally over to the hero's side. This was alright, nothing spectacular, nothing terrible, just an average issue of an average comic. Superwoman number 5, by Phil Jimenez. Ugh, why do I do this to myself? It's another issue and another opportunity for Lana to be a total bitch. At least she realizes that she's being unpleasant here, but it's not helping. I am so completely uninterested in the goings on in this book that it's hard to physically read it. Characters who I have no idea who they are just pop in for a panel or two seemingly without context. Maybe there was, but I checked out by then. This, ah, I can't. Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Adventures number 2, written by Matthew K. Manning and art by John Somariva. I'm going to have to say that this might have read a bit better if we hadn't just had a Batman Turtles crossover in the recent past. This covers a lot of standard heroes meets for the first time tropes, and it's done similarly to the one done previously. What also doesn't help that this is supposed to be teaming up the modern animated Turtles with Batman from the animated series, and the art style isn't capturing that. It doesn't look like the animated series. There's an obvious attempt, but it doesn't hold up. Batgirl and the Birds of Prey number 5, written by Julian Shauna Benson and art by Rogue Antonio. This was okay. A bit awkward, but generally alright. You can think what you want about the reveal of who the imposter oracle was, but it read pretty awkward to me. Other than the revelation and the exploration of the new oracle, there is not that much to this issue. Except at the end. I said this much. 
I saw that coming, and I'm not disappointed by it. It was the logical way to go with if you've been reading this book. The Flash, number 12, written by Joshua Williamson and art by David Gianfelice. One trend in superhero stories as of late is to casually reveal the hero's secret identity to friends, family, and random strangers. I'm looking at you, CW. This thankfully doesn't do that, despite seemingly setting up that very thing throughout the issue. Overall, it's okay. The expected conclusion to the story. It's not that great, it's not that bad. Star Trek to Boldly Go, number 3, written by Mike Johnson and art by Tony Chistein. Scratch what I said last time about the Borg assimilation process. Yes, they still use surgery like in early TNG, but we also clearly see them use their tubules to deliver nanoprobes into the victim's bloodstream. But that is a major tricky concern, not really an issue for most people. I want to give this issue credit because it gives a pretty good explanation for why the Borg is encroaching into the Alpha and Beta Quadrant this early, and I think it's shaping up to be a pretty decent Star Trek story. Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows Number 2, written by Jerry Conway and art by Ryan Stegman. This issue is told exclusively from Mary Jane's perspective, and it's about how she's stretching herself thin, trying to do many things, be a mom and a wife, be a superhero, run a small business and write a blog. With last issue being from Peter's perspective and this from MJ's, given how this issue ends, I wouldn't be too surprised if next issue is told from Annie's perspective. Did I think this issue was great? No. But I do think that this is more like the Spider-Man I want to read than anything else being published right now. Wonder Woman number 12, written by Greg Rucka and art by Nicola Scott. Not the most action-driven issue, but it doesn't have to be. This is basically establishing the driving force behind the Sierra terrorist network that was behind the attack in the mall in the last issue set in the past. It also ties that together with something that happened to Wonder Woman as a child, as well as the reason Steve Trevor got stranded in Themyscira in the first place. With this issue, I think it's safe to say that Azarello's take on the Greek pantheon of gods has been firmly retconned. DC Rebirth Holiday Special Number 1 This is an anthology of short, somewhat cheesy, and funny DC holiday stories, framed as a TV Christmas special. There's nothing here of importance to any ongoing storylines, not that that was expected, just to let people know. Your enjoyment of this will largely depend on how serious you want your comics to be. I kinda liked it. Did I enjoy all of it? No. but. A big part of it. It's 80 pages after all. Detective Comics number 946, written by James Tinian IV and art by Eddie Barrows. I must say, I am thoroughly enjoying this. Is it perfect? No, I still need some explanations for the leader of the victim group, and that may still come. There are some things that might have gone over my head in some of the individual encounters throughout this issue, but overall, I like this, and I think it shows off a more human side to Batman. Action Comics number 969, written by Dan Jurgens and art by Patrick Searcher. Despite the fact that a lot of the backstory of the quote unquote villains are explained here, it doesn't feel like anything actually happened in this issue. Sure, we find out why these people are out to kill Lex Luthor, something we kinda already knew, but other than that, it's just filler. Uh, so that was what I've been reading over the last few weeks. I could give you a reason for my absence, but let's face it, you don't really care. Did you enjoy this video? Please like, comment, subscribe, and whatever you do. And uh, if you didn't like it or disagree with me, please uh, let me know in the comments. I am done for this week. Or am I? Yeah, I probably am. Maybe. We'll see.